Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today, um, the so-called Chinese remainder theorem, which is one of the oldest puzzles in the history of mathematics, or some version, some theorem corresponding to one of the oldest puzzles in the history of mathematics. So a little bit of history is linked down in the description. And basically the puzzle goes as follows. So this is a variant of the original puzzle. The original puzzle, uh, which is, as I said, linked in the description, is a bit more complicated, uh, but it's basically the same. Um, so it goes back to a Chinese mathematician whose name I don't uh, dare to pronounce. Um, no, I, I, I shouldn't. I probably, I probably messed it up. Anyway, it's a very easy idea or a very easy puzzle. Um, you're asked basically to write down two numbers, which I call A and B. And the puzzle tells you, okay, you have two numbers, seven, and you have a number 11, and an unknown number n. And of course, let's say, let's say black n. And of course, if you would know a and b, you would know n anyway. So you want to, would like to know what n is. And the puzzle tells you, okay, um, if you arrange n in a seven times something square, Right. So we don't know what the something is, that's A. And in 11 times something square, again, we don't know what something is, B, then it almost works. You just have three remainder and you have one remainder. And the puzzle then asks you, well, what is N? If I give you this amount of information, can you please figure out what, for me what N is? Yeah, uh, so history is again linked down in the description. Apparently, um, some Chinese mathematicians like to think about kind of troop arrangements in rectangles, whatever. Anyway, this is a very classical question. Um, and of course, I've, I've already illustrated the answer, which is uh, 45. Right, so seven times six plus three is 45. 11 times four, as you can see here, so this is obviously four. This is six, right? This number is six, number is four. It's 44 and remainder is one. So that's, okay, I, I told you the answer, very good. But the, the point is, of course, um, how can we do this systematically, right? If I would have asked you for a, a much bigger system of congruences, so the more modern formulation would be, that there's a system of congruences that you would like to solve. Namely, you want to find n and you want to find the minimal n such that n is congruent three mod seven. That just means if you arrange n in a rectangle of length seven, then three remains and it's congruent one mod 11, same game with 11. And find the minimal n. Uh, the, just to be cl completely clear here, the minimal is referring to the following. So if I know that 45 is a solution, then I also know that 90 is a solution. Just why is 45? And I would know that um, whatever, k times 45 is a solution. So you're really interested in the in kind of the minimal one. So 90 doesn't count. I want, I want to know the minimal. And well, in general, you would see something like this. Uh, given some system of congruences, with some given remainders and some, some given moduli, can you find such an n? And this is really the analog of system of linear equations, just in terms of congruences. Uh, so that sounds pretty useful, right? Linear equations, sure, we all uh, learn how to solve them and learn how to like them. Well, I'm not sure whether you like them, but certainly they're very useful. And this is the analog. So yeah, it kind of makes sense to look at those. And kind of the question is, can we do this systematically instead of just, <laughs> just writing down the corresponding rectangles? And in what sense we're doing algebra? In what sense can this actually be generalized? So let me show you um, how you can actually prove in, in this setup, how, how uh, in the setup of, of two congruences, how you can actually prove the Chinese remainder theorem in the end, or in the other words, how you can find 45. So here's my box 45. And it works as follows. So I, I have seven and 11 given. 
Okay, let's say I like one more than the other. Let's say I like 11 more than the other. Um, so I draw an 11 times seven rectangle. Okay, 11 times seven. So the last number you see should be 11 times seven. Not quite, it's 11 times seven minus one because I start counting at zero. And then I do the following. I look at my remainder, one, and I mark the first column. Right. If I would have three, I would have marked the third column and so on. I look at my second remainder, or let's say the orange one, three. Well, let's say the blue one, three. And um, I start at three and then I count, I count seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, mark the next one. Mark the next one and so on. And the unique intersection of green and blue will be the answer. So let me show this to you in a linked Mathematica description live. So here's Mathematica and uh, it's exactly the same puzzle, right? You can choose the moduli here, five and 11, for example, you can choose the remainder two and one and it's the same game. So if you want to solve the congruence, what is the smallest number N which is congruent to modulo five and one modulo 11, you draw in 11 times five square, you mark the, the remainder of 11 as your row, uh, sorry, as your column, whatever, four, for example, and you start at two and go in steps of five. You start at three and go in steps of five and the unique intersection, you start at zero and go in steps of five. And the unique intersection is the number you're looking for. Um, let's do another example, 17 uh, modulo seven and, and seven. Okay, 17 and seven, or what we did before, 11. So we, before we had 11, so let's do 17 and seven. And my, I choose the 11th row, why not? And I have a congruence modulo two times 11. So I started two, count seven, all the way. I mark my uh, blue boxes. I have my, uh, green 11th row, column of course, and they intersect at 79 and that's my unique solution. And um, if you think about it carefully, that was basically the proof how you can solve um, one of those systems of e uh, congruences if you have two moduli and two remainders. So the general statement is then, if you have co-prime moduli and co-prime is really necessary, okay? Um, link in the description for the more general statement if you don't have any co-prime co remainders. So um, two different prime numbers, for example, would work like in this case, seven and 11. What you don't want to do is something like um, eight and 12. Eight and 12 are bad. They share two as a common, uh, uh, as a common prime number, so they're not co-prime. Anyway, so you choose co-prime moduli and certain remainders. And then there's unique N and N is determined by being inside of this square or the, the higher version of that square, a higher rectangle, which is the product of all moduli. So it's smaller than capital N and capital N is the product of all moduli. And they, it exists, there's a unique solution to the system. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, it exists and the solution is unique. So it's existence is un and uniqueness as you would usually like to see it in in any reasonable statement, right? It's, it exists and it is unique. And um, the uniqueness is forced by this condition. So it's the smallest one. So it, it's the one that you find here in the rectangle. It's really this intersection. Just think about a higher version of, of, of this illustration, like a higher dimensional version of this illustration. And kind of the link theoretical statement would then be then that this map, so n mod n, lives in n mod, uh, in z mod nz. Remember n is the product of the moduli and you can basically split it along the moduli. So this ring is isomorphic to this ring and this is a, kind of a, the canonical isomorphism. Right, it's a very nice statement. It's kind of a, and this is kind of the algorithm to solve, to solve the problem. So uh, the statement is basically this one. There's this canonical isomorphism between z mod n z, the product of so the product of the um, remainders uh, of the moduli and the uh, split of moduli, and as I said, this is the uh, basically the algorithm to solve it.
Right, that's not too bad, right? Um, I was also, about, also asking about the generalization. And yeah, so the generalization works basically in the same ring. You have a reasonable notion of co-prime, um, which just means you take two, two ideals and they add up to, to the whole ring. So they're co-prime. If you think about Bezus lemma, that, that's really some version of Bezus lemma. And instead of a kind of moduli, um, you have uh, ideals and you have the intersection of the ideals and you have exactly the same type of uh, isomorphism, which is kind of the version of existence and uniqueness. And it's also the same type of, of map. And if it's even commutative, then, then it, it's really the intersection is a product. So this is really just exactly the same as here, right? Those are the products. This is, so this is the product of all of them. And you split your ideal along the products of the ideals. And this works, for example, for um, polynomial rings. Yeah, but that's um, basically it. So uh, Chinese remainder theorem is this knife theorem, which tells you, uh, or at least the proof tells you an explicit way how to solve system of congruences. And the theorem itself basically is um, how to split Z mod N into smaller components. Uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.